All right, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Wait Your Turn. It's Jordan and today we are looking at the two latest updates for Tainted Grail by Awakened Realms. Updates number 48 and 49. Don't go anywhere. We're getting started. Let's see where Wave 2 is in terms of production, when it's going to arrive, and what's going into it. 3, 2, 1, let's go. All right, so... Update 49 is actually an addendum to episode number 48, and so we're going to start with 49 actually because this is the most important information that we are privy to, which is the fact that Tainted Grail will be arriving October, sorry, will be starting shipping in October 25th. That was a weird way of saying it. Tainted Grail will start shipping, oh man, that's another weird way of saying it. Tainted Grail Wave 2 will start shipping on October 25th. And so this is going to be pretty interesting. It's actually kind of, it kind of tugs at the heartstrings a little bit because it's coming full circle. It's ending and the trilogy will finally come to its completion. It's kind of interesting to see an entire trilogy or saga of stories kind of be wrapped up within as little, as little as a couple of years. So as much as, as it's an epic tale, I haven't completed the game myself. So this Thursday, uh, perhaps you'll already have seen that stream, but we are going to finish this game so we can get ready for wave two of Tainted Grail. So um, just running through all the things that they're mentioning, um, obviously they're gonna be affected by COVID and the delay that's gonna be carried over to wave two as well. But it looks like it's fairly simple. I mean, they have to create molds for all plastic components. The card files will be finished in June, I think in a couple days. They have the uh, very <laughs> sensible European system of smaller to larger, so days and then months. And uh, mass assembly and shipping from September uh, or most of September and then finally shipping from September 25th to October 25th. So only a month for uh, the containers from China to reach the various shipping hubs worldwide. So you didn't really need me to read that for you, but <laughs> it's very interesting to see uh, how Tainted Grail has taken us for a, a big ride. And now we'll be going to update 48 in which we'll actually get a look at uh, how this game has evolved in the later cycles, how they're going to attempt to potentially rectify some of the past, I wouldn't say mistakes, but the mechanical difficulties of Tainted Grail. And so, of course, uh, both updates mention uh, Nemesis Lockdown. We'll see, I might give a couple thoughts on it, but I mean, it's basically Nemesis, except you're locked down, different characters, new alien races, and new experiences as well. So I haven't played that game either, so I can't give many major opinions on that. But here are some beautiful pictures of the game being shipped out as it is. These are the language editions. Congratulations, my language backer friends for waiting this long and being patient regardless of the criticism and the reviews and still holding true to the tainted grail, whether it be tainted or true or not. So let me actually, if I check when these are going to arrive, perhaps we'll be playing Tainted Grail together. So <laughs> perhaps as I'm playing, uh, you'll also be able to play your version as well. So that will be kind of a fun experience uh, looking forward to that. So uh, they have been supervising the quality assurance process uh, without being in China, which is rather impressive, but they have learned from previous shipping from uh, Tainted Grail of the past and they've created a whole set of procedures for that which is really good so that they don't actually have to fly to China every single time um, so that's that is interesting um, at the same time I still think that they gave Tainted Grail a lot more love a lot more quality assurance than Etherfield's miniatures and general production I feel like Tainted Grail was like the peak of uh, Tainted Grail miniature making so anyway uh, that's just my opinion maybe it's an unpopular one but Again, plenty of beautiful boxes, Awakened Guard card sleeves. Let me know how good those sleeves actually turn out to be and various, variously shaped boxes based on the language versions. It's kind of interesting that some are bigger than others. Maybe that's just due to the rule book and the translation of that one. So uh, finally, we get a final personal update from Kristoff. Piskorski, um, I hope I said that name right. I think I, I've mastered his first name at the very least. So. Uh, I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's very kind of a nostalgic uh, reflection on this entire journey, him being the main author, and his writing is 
clearly a privilege to read and I'm, I'm glad that they chose him because even though each paragraph or instance of experience in Tainted Grail is so small, it's incredibly compact and incredibly flavorful and powerful. I almost wish that he just wrote more just to make the story more in-depth and just more um, more worthwhile, especially with all the mechanical interruptions, I feel like. Uh, his story writing is by far uh, superior to most, so um, <laughs> he can put a wait your turn seal of approval on his resume, that's for sure, and I will not deny him that honor so <laughs> if he even watches these videos. But anyway, uh, as many of you know, the manufacturing of Tainted Grail stretch goals and add-ons has already started, the plastic components are being produced, and the hundreds and hundreds of cards of the three new great campaigns last night and the Age of Legends campaigns is going to be ushering forth in uh, stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks. So the excitement is real on their part, and they mentioned later it's very interesting because uh, the journey is over for them. They know all the secrets, they know all the storytelling, they know all the mechanics that have been uh, injected into Tainted Grail, and now it's really up to us to experience what they left behind. So they are the legends, we are gonna be experiencing what they've uh, given us, and this includes, I, I appear, I'm assuming, the Red Death as well. Yes, that will be coming in wave two as well. So we're looking at a sizable amount of campaign material, including, uh, I, I totally forgot about Echoes of the Past, Red Death, the two major campaigns as well. So there's like four major elements. I totally forgot how big these pledges were, but those are gonna be coming as well, and that will reinvigorate a lot of our play sessions so it'll be interesting to see uh, how will those factor into our current play sessions of Tainted Grail whether or not we have completed this game so the fact that it's gonna be knocking on our door again with more more elements and angles of replayability is something that I whoa I totally blanked out on but that's gonna be coming wave two and wave two I mean it's June right now but four months is not too far away uh, and it's almost exactly four months I can wait four months I mean it's not a year or anything so kudos to <laughs> to awaken realms for just working on it and grinding on it and not being lazy or sloppy in any of their approaches so such a good company and just invigorating absolutely enthusiastically exciting so um they mentioned a couple different elements of different characters so dagan duana nazir 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 and sloan and uh i'm actually very excited i feel like these new campaigns will be a refinement due to a number of the points of feedback that we've given for the previous uh, base core game of Tainted Grail. So I feel like this is almost going to be an elevation of Tainted Grail, the core anyway, the Fall of Avalon expansion or core. And so um, just looking at them, there's a lot of flavor in their base characteristics. Dagan, he can't play too many cards in one sequence or else he loses cards. He mills his own deck for each additional card beyond the, I guess, one card. So every additional card is costing you. It's very heavy. Um, Duana has random abilities that possesses cards that allow her to stack the odds in her favor, representing gambles with supernatural powers. I like that a lot. Uh, Nazar can play some cards during other characters' activations. I really like that, the flavor of that and like instant interrupts. I feel like there was like a missing synergy with, you know, playing as a party. I felt like you, you kind of missed out on that element of really being able to help out other than just building the chain. And then Sloan can benefit from long attack chains as many tools to strategically tamper with the sequence. I like that. Sloan is actually really funny looking to me. Like I really enjoy just how he looks. Like he's just so beautifully gaunt and just <laughs> kind of depressingly fitting. Um, I, I use him in this ward mine anytime, but he is just absolutely just I just I just find his face incredibly funny. I don't know why. It's just so sallow, so like series of unfortunate events esque. So I, I'm definitely gonna be playing with Sloan and Doana looks pretty good, even though her miniature is like, ah, you know, it's just kind of weird. But we'll get into those miniatures later in this update. And they uh, they've also updated the encounters, as you might have noticed. There's some new ideas, some neat mechanical twists that they mentioned, as well some new keywords that we get to learn. Um, something thing about these Awakened Realms games is that they don't make it easy on you. Every single step of the way is meant to make it harder. Like they'll take away certain elements, certain advantages you have relied on previously, they just vanish in an instant. So like there's one that's like anti-magic, so you can't even spend magic, or ones that will just make you immediately go crazy and start panicking. So 
uh, these new campaigns are going to be more difficult. I mean, you can start any of the campaigns individually as they are, but I can I can sense the difficulty being raised. So if you're already kind of uh, off put by the fact that the core game was already slightly difficult, myself <laughs> included, I refuse to play story mode. However, uh, at least not formally anyway. I'll still cheat and do story mode on my own time, but these new campaigns are going to be something of a challenge. So that's why I'm going to get in my practice time while I can, uh, try and finish this core base campaign, and then hopefully we'll branch out to the other campaigns as well for an epic finale. So I only have four months to do that, so whew, a lot of pressure on me. So uh, one thing that they did mention that was interesting is an explosive doomed thrall that requires either a single precise strike or rapid annihilation or also a blow up in your face. Obviously, I mean, just a quick interpretation of this is like you have to deal exactly eight damage or you have to deal like 15 damage. So you have to like really get your damage counters exactly correct to deal the correct like insta-kill method. I really enjoy that. I like how you can precisely strike Precisely strike, meaning you do a precise amount of damage, which is exactly the amount you need to kill it, rather than just going overboard. So I like that element too, it gives you this this deeper flavor as to actually fighting these various entities, so I enjoy that too. A legendary Kelpie tries to abduct a party member and carry them to a faraway location. I really enjoy that. I, it's kind of a it's kind of a shame that the only uh, core game equivalent of that is the Four Dweller, or well, spoiler or not, that would more or less chase you. So I feel like most of you already know if you've played a couple of chapters of Tainted Grail. Ah, maybe I should have spoiled that. Ah, all right, I'll 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 bleep that out probably. So, um, but there there aren't that many equivalents of, a, of an entity that forces you to move. And that could really throw off your plans if you are forced into that sort of movement. So, and then finally they have a land dispute. Unlike other diplomatic encounters, this one will, will require you to keep the affinity marker directly in the middle. I think this is interesting because normally you just, you know, you drop down. So obviously this one's going to keep you within this diplomatic encounter for like three or four rounds, I suppose. And you have to maintain it in the middle. And if you don't, then one side or the other will succeed. So uh, keeping it exactly in the middle, that's actually a very interesting challenge uh, to make. Uh, but at the, on the other hand, you will potentially just have to raise the challenge or raise the diplomatic encounter by one every single turn. So maybe it won't be that bad. So very interesting. I, I enjoy that too. As you can see, they're getting very creative with how they're approaching these uh, these new abilities. So I feel like based on their core engine, they're just getting more and more creative moving forward. And I love that. Uh, and I hope this helps me love the game more. But I'm pretty sure Tainted Grail is going to stay Tainted Grail. They're not going to change too many of the basic mechanics up. Um, I don't think they're going to make it any easier. It looks like they're just making it harder, as I've said. So uh, encounters, skills, and print and play, that's the next section. And uh, he says they could go on, but it's best to just let the cards speak for themselves. And if you're not too afraid, you can look at them with me. I mean, I'm not going to look at them too closely right now. Uh, one thing that is interesting are these triple symbols. So you have to have three of an attribute, meaning two, a maxed out attribute, as well as, you know, a, a third ability card on the side or trait card uh, that comes with maxing out different attributes. And uh, it's really interesting to actually see these arts uh, used. I mean, we've seen them at the end of updates over and over again, but it's nice to actually see them on the cards uh, and to see the layouts fully used. So, um, and again, I mean, it's very, very smart of them to make art that is appropriate for these cards, where the bottom, there's so much space on the bottom so they can put these uh, text boxes without infringing too much. There is one card actually here that I have a gripe with, but uh, Jordan always has gripes on his turn, and that is this one, this Kowlin inner weird card where you can't even see the art at all there wasn't actually enough space left on the bottom and you can't actually even see what's there other than this text box on the other hand it's really cool to see this huge tech box text box text box because it gives you so much flexibility in how you use this card so much flexibility basically meaning you have two choices so you can either uh gain two charges and um, you can spend those two charges on either this one or this ability. One allows you to draw a card and gain two wounds, and this one allows you to ignore the enemy attack. So it's interesting that they have two charges instead of just one charge, so you can kind of 
proliferate them or multiply the charges on the card. I think that's kind of a nice touch. But again, just the, the layout and the art, it's just, it's a shame. I, I wish I knew uh, what was here. It looks like someone probably exploding weirdness out of them, I'm, I'm imagining. And then, oh, you can actually look at more cards by clicking this. Uh, then they have the uh, starting character attributes and decks. Um, it looks like they'll probably be borrowing a number of diplomacy and combat cards from, you know, Bjor, Ali, Ailey, Maggot, and Arev, Arev, and Neve. So, um, that'll be interesting. Nothing too crazy there. There's Dagon's ability. I'm assuming that's his drawback. And then we have Slowens, who you can pay an energy to discard a card. And then the next card does not need to connect with the lightning uh, prompt which is super good. That flexibility is amazing and will be crucial, I'm assuming. Uh, the other ones don't have listed abilities, but you can see their attributes and et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's really interesting, kind of the meat of this, of this update are the new encounter traits. They really give you a sense of what the environment is gonna be like. And I'm assuming, this might be for both campaigns, but I'm assuming, I'm assuming, let's just say, well, this one has army mechanics in it, so this is probably going to be for Age of Legends, but uh, Age of Legends? No, actually, these are actually all of the new keywords for both Age of Legends and uh, the later one, The Last Night. Uh, you can tell because they have both uh, keywords that involve using an army, as well as ones that involve exposure and gaining, uh, basically, frostbite, So as it says here. So these are all of the new encounter traits, but potentially they'll add more, but I think because that they've uh, just spoiled them right now, this is probably their working list. So they don't want to add too many more, even though these are actually very, uh, very flavorful and very creative as well. So anti-magic is the worst one. You can't even use magic, but it makes sense. I mean, reminds me of Magic the Gathering. Uh, Challenger, where if you, you you beat your challenger just by using your army. So like someone comes out with a sword and they're like, you know, I'll take you on one by one on one, mano on mano. And instead you just you know, like call, tell your archers to just uh, sick this guy. Then uh, you actually lose reputation for using your armed advantage. So kind of a shame there, um, but it makes a lot of sense. If someone's, you know, challenging you, you don't just like pull out a machine gun from your uh, your uh, cavalry and just mow them down. So there's some sort of honor-based kind of knight uh, Arthurian mechanic here. So I love that they're they're staying focused. They're staying focused on that basic uh, characteristic of this of this setting, and they haven't discarded that in favor of crazier, wackier ideas. Uh, frostbite, of course, when you take damage, you gain exposure. Uh, hunger, you, where you can. Um, it looks like by having the red sign secret card. Oh, it looks like this is also actually for the Red Death campaign expansion where it has, if you have the red sign secret card, enemy has rage and find traits during your activation step. I think they mentioned something where if you did have, uh, if you were more infected by the Red Death already, then the campaign would actually get easier. But it looks like here in this case, uh, the enemy will actually get stronger and have more rage and find traits. Uh, that could make it even more menacing. Speaking of menacing, there's another keyword for menacing. So uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. I'm not sure where they, they'll they all belong, but it looks like there's about four or five different new keywords or traits uh, for each new upcoming expansion. So it's crazy that they managed to whip out three new expansions in the time they made the core game. So I wonder how the size is actually gonna compare and the exploration journal, I wonder how that's all gonna scale in size. So interesting and a work in progress yet to undergo the final proofing um and give some feedback in the comments below as always hopefully this huge pack of cards will let you see for yourself that the second wave is now really close and that it dwarfs the core box well yeah i'd, I'd assume that it's more content than the core box and uh, i wonder how it'll compare uh in an experience way. Is it going to improve upon the experience of Tainted Grail? Is it just going to be the same thing with new keywords, new challenges, new cards? And uh, it's going to be kind of the same kind of grind, just with different flavors. So we'll see how that is. And finally, Kristoff gives us a final little talk about um, the interconnectedness of all the campaigns, uh, where you can start anywhere, uh, but of course, each campaign will influence the other ones. So it's kind of, this is going to be the closest thing I've seen so far to time travel in a board game where you can start at any moment in time in this chronological scale and influence both the past and the future of all of your playthroughs. So it's going to be kind of a long-term investment because 
each core game is hours upon hours upon hours to even complete it and even get into a position where you can influence the next campaign, but nothing saying that you can't use failed campaigns to influence the, either the Age of Legends or the Last Night campaigns as well. So, of course, you can't play the Red Death expansion unless you do complete a campaign, but that's besides the point. I'll get there. Another thing that he mentioned that was interesting is that uh, the size and scale of the entire Tainted Grail, I'm going to just call it franchise, is that it exceeds the size of Dune, Fellowship of the Ring, Song of Ice and Fire, the Game of Thrones. I'm not saying that this makes Tainted Grail by any means better than any of these books, because these are all insanely high bars, and in fact, word count will never make something better than anything. It's all about the quality of the writing. Um, but yeah, that's, that, <laughs> that's a very kind of vain comparison between Dune, Game of Thrones, Fellowship of the Ring, and uh, Tainted Grail. Those are all much better, much better books <laughs> in terms of uh, narrative scope and twists and things like that. Although I can see their comparison and perhaps their inspiration, inspired uh, reckoning or uh, grab of materials from those as well. There are some kind of similar moments. But anyway... They do mention uh, that they are proud of how the story of the game turned out. They did a great job, and our journey through Avalon is at its end. But fortunately, yours and mine is only starting. So kind of a oh, just brings a tear to my eye, almost very nearly. Don't cry, I don't cry. And <laughs> um, yeah, that's uh, that's gonna be it. So October, it will all come to an end, and then uh, we'll see. Who can complete this game first? I'm not. I'm not sure. Will I paint everything first before I do it? I don't know. You let me know if you want to see me paint this game. I might. I might. I don't. I don't think I'm gonna paint any more monster miniatures. That's for sure. So finally, we're gonna move into the 3D printed models. I believe these are the master molds, actually, for the alternative monsters of Avalon. Or sorry, monsters of past and future. They haven't done the huge chicken bird yet, but the of course the detail on the master molds is gonna be the best of all the miniatures you'll see. So expect this to be the best miniature quality of all the miniatures that you'll see because these are the, the master molds having been 3D printed. So obviously resin is next best after that and then PVC uh, takes a turn. Uh, so there are three stages of quality to anticipate. I'm really, really excited about Maeve, Maeve, I think it's Maeve, uh, and she just looks absolutely stellar. Look at those biceps, man, she is, jacked and ready i i, I want to take a look at that harp too but she's always blocking it but i love this foghorn scepter thing in the back as well so really really cool stuff slow and again i just can't get enough of this long-haired gaunt skeleton of a man with his family's sword one thing i do regret about all these may not regret personally but uh, one thing i don't like about these miniatures so far is that a lot of the plastic that's involved in these kind of morphs into one another so uh the lines aren't as defined like the sword is part of his cloak and even though that does kind of stabilize the shape uh at the same time it um it, it, it might just look a little bit globular and it probably won't look as good as just having the sword being a standalone piece. So I feel a lot of these small details, although cool, will potentially just melt into his clothes. So I hope that they can maintain that level of refinement and distinguishing different pieces from one another just to make painting a little bit easier. Again, I don't really have too many comments on the monsters. They kind of look like they belong from Hell the Last Saga. This one's kind of cool. These kind of weird ether fields like beasties. Um, this, uh, the one-armed, one-legged giant, good detail. This one kind of looks like a bunch of roasted chickens on the side of him. Kind of weird. And these ones are nice, yeah. That one's, uh, it's a spider with man hands, you know, you know the drill. Uh, satyr lady, hooded man. Yeah, none of these miniatures really ring too true. They don't really resonate that much with me. Uh, but interesting to see, nevertheless. This one was actually really cool. This is Kelpie, I, I believe, and that one turned out really well. But remember, this is a resin version, and uh, it already looks like kind of like a PVC version. So, But I like how melted it kind of looks in the best way possible. And uh, I still don't know why she's on uh, the back of this monstrosity backwards. But anyway, um, who's this guy? Arif? No. Ah, I totally, it's the Balt and fuel they both look pretty good i mean again the plastic kind of melts into uh the textures are kind of lost here and there but uh it's pretty good i think i'm just spoiled in in general and then this is the famous duana pose it's just like ah <laughs> just like a running man uh logo her arms are just ooh, 
very, very gaunt. She needs to eat a hamburger or something. And then we have good old Nazar who looks really good, actually. He's probably one of my favorite miniatures other than good old Funky Sloan. So, and then Doggin looks good. And uh, this little girl, I forgot her name too, but maybe Young Fuel. But anyway, uh, and then the good old precious, beautiful little donkey. Um, everything's looking, oh, and then there's more, oh my goodness, I keep on surprising myself. Red Death components, they're looking really good. The detail looks very present here, very disgusting. Uh, the Dance Macabre looks a little bit uh, melted. Uh, and then, of course, we have the mounts. Uh, these, remember, these are all resins, and one thing I was a little worried about is that you do see some bending up here on Bjor's hammer, so that's gonna, I mean, if it, they can't manage to get it straight on resin, it's probably only gonna get worse with uh, PVC production, but um, things are looking good. The mounts came out super stellar, a lot of good details, uh, much better than the Monsters of Avalon uh, from First Glance. You have Meave on her jackrabbit, jackalope. You have this young girl on her wolf. Oh, I guess her wolf has grown up. That's actually a cool element, the fact that you fight with your wolf and then you can ride on your wolf. Always love mounts. Uh, then we have good old Erev on his war horse. Slow one on his poor beaten down depressed horse. It kind of looks like Eeyore, maybe 20 years into the future. And then we have our final maggot thatcher and uh, the Baltz horse as well. And then, wow, all right, we still have so many more. Oh my goodness. Yeah, basically, all the mounts look great. Looks amazing. Pets look great. More monsters. Great, great, great. And then the TG Companion is up and online. I should actually use this uh, for tomorrow. So, um, yeah, so that's basically it. I haven't actually used the Companion app yet, so I'll give that a try and see if it's better than actually using the... Um, the normal book, it probably actually will be. And uh, yeah, wow, now that I think about it, I should actually go ahead and use that. And then finally, uh, there's no narrator for that, which I'm sure is a disappointment, but potentially they, mm, let's see. Uh, so far, there's no narrator, just based on how their production is going so far. Uh, we don't have a narrator that we can easily use. That's being said, this is the first iteration, and so they'll see how things go and look at your feedback. So maybe, so if there is a potential, they're leaving it open um, based on the demand. So if you want to make sure that happens, I mean, they always listen to community feedback. They always act on it too. So put your comments down below if you really, really are dying for a narrator, and I would enjoy that as well. I'd like to see them uh, branch off into that and potentially just merely introduce like foreteller uh, production as well and um, yeah well done Awakened Realms well done so as always they end with some final art with uh, Thibault being a absolute bad apple and um, <laughs> I like how he's kind of like Frankenstein's monster and they kept this very pointy hood I don't know why they did that exactly but he's going about thrashing everyone chanting praying and planning and that is update 48 and 49. I'm sorry if this is a overly long video, but thank you all for joining me today on Wait Your Turn and helping us reach a thousand subscribers. I haven't, I don't know if I'm going to make a celebration video or anything about that, but uh, thank you for being along for the ride and for making this channel great. So thank you all for sticking around. Uh, let me know down below in the comments how excited you are for Red Death Expansion, Age of Legends, or The Last Night, and whether or not you've actually finished the campaign to enjoy these. So uh, remember, we're going to be doing live streams of Tandy Grail on Thursday at, what is it, 1700 Pacific Standard Time. So feel free to join me and help guide me through the mists of Avalon and the weirdness that we will inevitably succumb to or not we shall prevail so let me know down below uh, subscribe like support the channel on patreon if you so desire and i'll see you all next time so thanks for waiting thanks for watching and now it's your turn mm -hmm.